It's this Jewish teacher called Hillel the Elder. It's, uh, pretty smart guy, had a big following. Hillel tells his disciples that he is going to perform an important religious duty. That would have been just very big, right? Like rabbi says something like that. You're like, oh man, he's about to, it's about to go down. We're about to see something happen. They ask him, what is the commandment he is going to do? They probably thought he was going to visit a sick person or give charity to a needy individual. But Hillel tells them that he is going to the bathhouse. They are shocked. Does taking a bath constitute the performing of a mitzvah? Hillel tells them a story. A king hires a laborer to wash his statuary, all of his statues. If a human king pays his laborer to care for his statue, how much more value is a person created in the image of God worthy of care? The one washing oneself must acknowledge the divine presence and recognize that personal esteem and simple actions such as taking a bath are fulfilling God's commitments as much as other religious duties. That's an example of a rabbinic teacher making a very deep point and shocking his followers through a parable. You can take that down. <laughs> That's funny. I didn't know you guys were going to put that up there. Uh, this mic's still coming in really hot on my end, uh, Kevin. So, um, if you weren't here last week, I spent a, about 10 days in Israel and was inspired uh, by my time there to teach a series on the parables and talk about the parables because why else I was standing and experiencing and watching and looking and walking in, in the land that Jesus taught from. I mean, I was seeing the parallels in the way that he taught and the way that he spoke. And a third, if you look at the synoptic gospels, and what I mean by synoptic gospels are the ones that are very similar to each other, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John kind of did his own thing, okay? But if you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in those gospels... Uh, one third of everything that Jesus says is in parable form, okay? One third of everything that he says is in parable form. So this guy named Brad Young, who wrote a book on this and studies it a lot, had a fairly long definition, but I want to read it for you because have you ever just thought through like, what is a parable? How, how would I explain that, okay? The Hebrew parable, mashal, has a wide range of meanings. The word is stretched from its base meaning of similarity or resemblance to cover any type of illustration from a proverbial saying to a fictitious story. It may refer to a proverb, riddle, anecdote, fable, or allegory. A mashal defines the unknown by using what is known. It defines the unknown by using what is known. The mashal begins where the listener is, but then pushes beyond into a new realm of discovery. The rabbinic parable illustrates its point by redescribing in drama the nature of God and human responses to his love. So the Hebrew word is mashal. The Greek word, which means very similar to the same thing, is where we get our word parable. It's paraboli, uh, paraboli maybe, uh, which is very similar in meaning. And then Jesus would have kind of honed in on this idea of parable, which is another word, and then I'll stop giving you brand new words, called Haggadah, which is storytelling with a message. Storytelling with a message. And this type of storytelling was generally used in a way that could bridge the gap between social and cultural elites, if you will, and the everyday commoner. So in our, our world, we might say the highly educated uh, uh, group and, uh, and the rest of us, okay? So Jesus' teaching was, uh, it, he could speak it in Jerusalem with a lot of religious elites. 
He could speak it in the region of Galilee out in the country. And uh, he could take these simple things like seeds and flocks and vines and tell stories about them that have this deeper meaning that are used to communicate truth, eternal truth. Okay? So I want to start today in uh, the one that really came to me when I was uh, walking around Galilee. I have a video for you. And we'll watch the video, and then we'll read the parable, and we'll see how well uh, I did uh, teaching this thing from memory. So this is me in Galilee. So I'm in the mountains of Israel, and I'm reminded just so clearly of one of Jesus' teachings about the seed that scattered along the path. The seed uh, is really, a, the, the, the story is really a teaching about the soil of our heart. But he says, sometimes you scatter the seed and the soil is too rocky and seed doesn't grow. Sometimes the birds come and take it before it's had an opportunity to take root. Sometimes the sun is too hot and it's scorched. Other times the weeds, which represent the cares and worries of this world, choke the seed out. And then other times the seed takes root. The seed falls on soil that's ready to receive it. We receive the truth. We receive Jesus. You know, I found this to be an ongoing thing for me. The soil of my heart can harden. Even though I've initially received the truth of Jesus, even though I've initially received who he is, I've initially received his humility, his character, his fruit. I have to remind myself over and over that my heart can harden and I have to check the soil of my heart. So how's the soil of your heart? Wow, Jesus used everything at his disposal to teach. And the one thing that I've realized is that Jesus taught with a view. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so that was the mountainside around Galilee. So probably had a hard time keeping his disciples focused. Just the beautiful view of that water with the sunlight reflecting off of it. So let me read the parable. I did my best to summarize it there. We'll see how I did. We'll see if I missed anything. Then we'll pray and then we'll get into it. He taught them many things. This is Mark 4, 2 through 20. He taught them many things by parables. And his teaching said, listen, a farmer went out to sow seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, or 100 times. Then Jesus said, he who has ears, let him hear. In other words, he who has been given the ability to hear. Let them hear. When he was alone with the twelve and the others around him, ask him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that, he's quoting Isaiah here, they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. So I want to stop right there for a second because that's confusing. So Jesus is quoting Isaiah, okay? Isaiah had this really, I mean, if you were to just look at it through human standards, a bit of an unfair thing happened to him and that he had one of the greatest visions of Jesus ever recorded in history, maybe the greatest vision of Jesus ever recorded in history. He had this powerful moment where this angel like touches his tongue with a hot coal and it represents he's unclean and the people are unclean and they need mercy and forgiveness. And then he's called uh, who will go? I'll go. And he goes out and then he finds out that the people are not in a season where they're ready to receive. So he just preaches to hardness his whole life. And it's this whole question between what does it look like to be faithful even when there's no fruit, which is kind of a different story. But Jesus is paralleling here how there are people in Israel that are going to hear this word. And there are people in Israel that are not going to, it's going to, the seed's not going to, it's not going to take root. Okay. Much like Isaiah, it's not going to take root. So then Jesus said to them, don't you understand the parable? 
Okay? He actually thought they under, I think this is what's kind of funny to me is I think he thought they understood it. You know, and then uh, you guys aren't laughing, but this is funny to me because uh, then he finds out they didn't understand it either. You know, so don't you understand the parable? How then will you understand any parable? It's like you're going to have a really hard time with my teachings if you don't get what I'm what I'm doing here. OK, he says the farmer sows the word. So the truth, the gospel, uh, John would even say Jesus is the word. So to receive the word, to receive truth is to receive Jesus. OK, some people are like seed along the path. Where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. I mean, that's a thing. I don't, it's hard to build like theology around that. Like, I don't, I don't know how to package that neatly for you and give it to you in a way that it feels okay. Except that Satan is like this devourer. It's like locusts. And, and the moment, the moment a seed is sown, he wants to come and snatch it and take it. Okay? Before it takes root. And some of you, I've prayed with people very recently that have had a wonderful encounter with God. And an amazing encounter with, with the spirit or just something new hit you or something refreshing. And then you go, man, things are going to be awesome. And then that might happen. Sometimes that happens for a long time. Like you have this encounter with God, things are awesome for a long time. Sometimes you have an encounter with God and then things become really difficult for a long time. And there's a lot of persecution and suffering and spiritual warfare around what's happened in your life. Okay? Because the enemy wants to rob what God has begun. He wants to steal what God has started. He wants to bring it to an end. He wants to take that from you, okay? Um, some people, something comes at 16. Others are like seeds sown on rocky places. They hear the word at once and receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes, uh, because of the word, they quickly fall away. Um, there is a, I don't say this is like always the case, but when, when you have this first encounter with Jesus, there, there's a bit of a honeymoon phase. Okay, there's a bit of a honeymoon phase. And we, your relationship with God kind of goes like this. Not, not, not meaning that that's, the, like the the valleys are, um, that, that's that's that, that, that's where God gives you things you never thought you could receive. So I'm not saying valleys like valleys are bad, but there's just seasons in our walk with Him. There's just seasons, okay? And I think that our heart initially is softened. Like I think that you know this would have if if you would have been as I was studying this this week. Uh, the, the, it would have been common for the farmers of that day to really pray for the rainy season before the sowing season because the, the rain season before the sowing season is what would actually soften the ground enough just so they could even break it and get seed in the ground. Yeah, just so they could even, just so they could even plant something. But I found, I found for me like this ongoing assessment of my heart because have you ever just things were great and then six months later you find yourself in this place and you go, I feel hard-hearted right now. Nothing's getting through. Okay? And I'm feeling like, man, I can't seem to, I feel numb to my relationship with God. Am I the only one that's ever felt like that? So you get to this point, you just go, it feels numb. Like it doesn't, you know, you don't want to live your whole life based on what you feel, but you know what I mean by that. It's dry, it's numb. And I think that these seasons of rockiness where the soil can harden, uh, that we're all going to walk through them. And there's things that harden our heart, like unforgiveness. Okay? There's things that harden our heart, like bitterness. which unforgiveness often leads to. 
And that one is so important because I don't know that you can really move forward. It doesn't change God's love for you. It doesn't change the fact that you're his. But I don't know that you can move forward in any way, shape, or form in your relationship with God if you're, if, if, if you're living in a state of unforgiveness. It just jams up the pipes, man. It doesn't flow. Things can't flow. So we have to be willing to look at that in our hearts. Or am I bitter? You know, some of you, you may take it further. You know, do you hate someone? Jesus said, well, that's the same as murder. Why? Why would hate be the same as murder? Well, because you hate someone, you despise their existence. So that's why he links those two together. Right? So our ability to receive and, 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 and walk in love towards other people will be very hindered by unforgiveness and bitterness in our hearts. So we have to be willing to see that and check, check the soil. Okay? And then he goes on to say, um, still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Okay, now, you'll see Jesus talk about wealth a lot. He never says wealth in and of itself is a bad thing. It's not. But we would all know that the more, if you're not careful, the pursuit of things can leave you strung out, frazzled, and thin on the inside. If you're driven by more, okay, if you're driven by more or if your life is based on material things, you will find yourself strung out and thin on the inside because you're existing for things that are out here and hoping that those things are going to fill what's in here, okay? Now, once again, there's nothing wrong with wealth, it's an incredible opportunity to be generous, incredible opportunity to leave a legacy for your family. We don't speak negatively about that here. But if there's a focus on the material things and we become so consumed with those things, then the cares and the worries and the anxieties of more, more, more can choke out the word. Okay? Some of you, the last two years, okay, if you just think about like our country the last two years and even the church, there's just been this root system that's just grown over, okay? You come out, you, you come out on the other side of a pandemic and you go, my gosh, what just happened? I feel like we all went to a wormhole. And you go, why do I feel differently about 400 different things? Or why does the, the emotional energy and passion that I had for these things, why is it gone? Why does it feel choked out? Why are there people that I don't like now? <laughs> Nervous laughter, right? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like you get this, this thing just, it, it grows up. We get so consumed with what's happening out here, the cares of the world. The rhythms and the patterns of your life can choke you out, okay? Jocelyn and I have to think through this. Okay, like, a, all right, our kids are doing things. We're doing things. We're busy. They're busy. There's a pattern of the world. How are we going to participate as active members of society but live out the pattern of the kingdom? How do we do both at the same time? Right? Like, how do we continually find green pastures? How do we Sabbath? Do we believe in rest? Do we actually believe in rest? Or do we buy into the cultural lie that rest is weak and must not be tolerated? You must go, 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 go and burn yourself out. Or are we going to fight that even if it means saying no to things that we might say yes to? Like, are we going to live by the pattern of the world or are we going to renew our minds and live by the pattern of the kingdom? So I think that this is another way that we can assess ourselves, the weeds. And, you know, I've just loved doing communion every week. And Melissa, it was so ironic. You shared the, uh, what's it called? Shoot. Sneakerella. That was kind of a parable. Right? While she was telling it, I was like, that's very parabolic and that she's using this modern day thing that we can see to teach us about something eternal. Okay? But one thing I love about communion every week is that it's this opportunity 
this opportunity to assess our hearts in all of these areas. Am I harboring unforgiveness? God, what was I consumed with this week? Is there anyone uh, that I need to repent to or ask for forgiveness? Are there weeds that I need to pull? Am I being choked out by the pursuits of things in this world? Or have I built this weed kingdom around me and now it's all caving in? That sounds terrifying, right? But you know what I mean, okay? All right, so then he says... The words of the life, deceitfulness of wealth, and desires of other things come and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. Okay? So this is typically in your Bibles titled like the parable of the sower or the parable of the seed. That's really wrong. It's really the it's really a parable about soil. It's really a parable about soil. So if I was up here right now, which I am, and I, uh, it's an existential moment, and I, and I dropped a seed right here, nobody does anything. Water it, water's running off the sides, right? We come back next week. Has it done anything? No. What about the carpet? Water it. Some fertilizer. Yeah, besides what's already growing over here under the state. No. Yeah, some mildew maybe. But no. So if we go outside, drop it in the parking lot, same thing. Okay? But if we go out there in the little in-between where those trees are growing and we dig a little bit and we drop it, well, depending on all the things that we know about seeds, there's a chance there that it could take root and grow. The seed is the seed. Okay? The, the word, the truth of who God is, Jesus Christ himself, he's unchanging. He's unchanging. He's the same. Okay? He's the same. His words are the same. His truth is the same. His spirit, the Holy Spirit that wants to produce this fruit in you is the same. But soil is always different. The surface that that seed lands on is different. And it really makes a big deal. Like my, uh, I've had this uh, really just ongoing relationship uh, that's been rather hostile with sod over the course of my adult life. And there's been many times where I didn't think I was going to ever pull through, but I've, uh, I've, I've learned a lot about sod. So we had to put some sod in the back and it's one of those places, just bear with me for a minute. It's one of those places where the shade is too much and the sun's not enough. And then certain times of the year, the sun's too much and the shade's not enough and it just fries. It doesn't grow. So before I put the sod down this last time, Instead of worrying about the sod, instead of worrying about the shade or worrying about the sun or any of that, the first thing that I addressed is I put down fresh soil because when I looked under it, I realized it was rocky. Like there were rocks everywhere. I mean, I was like, man, I don't even, yeah, this is probably it. So put soil down, fresh topsoil all over the entire area, put the sod down. It's been the greenest grass I've ever had. I'm proud to say, okay, greenest grass I've ever had. It was all about the soil. Okay, now this is so simple. Okay, it's not like I'm insulting your intelligence by talking to you about my grass. But that's what Jesus did. Okay, that's what Jesus did. Because we want to reject these simple things. Okay, it's like, no, teach me something mind blowing so I can fix myself. No. Your heart's hard. Okay, your heart's hard. I uh, I get into these seasons where I'm. It's it's embarrassing to say. I feel like I'm comparing myself to who I was two months ago, or comparing myself to who I thought I would be today spiritually, or comparing myself to someone else. Or, or, or beating myself up because I don't think I've done enough. 
And the opposite side of that is feeling really good because I think I've done more than enough or feeling really good compared to who I was two months ago. I get on this hamster wheel and it's all a way of avoiding Jesus because it's about me and how, how good I think I'm doing. Okay? And I think that the Lord's been talking to me a little bit this week about this parable. I've just been stirring on, because uh, you say, well, Jared, I, th- I think my heart is hard. I do feel like I have a hard heart. And I, I understand you. I understand that. I, I get in those places too. But this week, um, I've just been praying for mercy. Why? Because I, for some reason, when I cry out for mercy, it breaks the hard soil in my heart because that's a very humbling thing to pray for. And I would love to present God with my trophy case of excellence, but I don't have one. I would love to present God with, man, I'm your top pupil. But I find that my heart, when I'm in that place, is hardened. Just as much as if I had been away from him for four months and hadn't even considered following Jesus. So it's in those moments that I pray for mercy. And every morning, right? Every morning when we wake up, there's mercy. He's merciful. You want to prepare your heart? Ask for his mercy. Bathe in his mercy. Be washed in his mercy. It's there for you. No, not for me. No, if it's for me, it has to be for you. Because I know me. Okay? If it's for me, it has to be for you. So I want us to stand together before we move into a time of prayer. And I want to lead us in prayer, hopefully a prayer that's going to break up the clay. Hopefully a prayer that's going to break up the soil. And you feel free to pray with me. Father, we ask for mercy. Father, we ask for mercy. We pray for mercy this morning. In all the areas of hardness in our heart, Lord, if we're if we've remained shallow, and we've received things. You've been giving us gifts over the last few months and we haven't watered them and we haven't cultivated them and we've allowed the sun to scorch it. Then Lord, we ask for mercy and we pray that you'll sow another seed into our heart and we receive it. And God, for those that are experiencing those, the bird that comes and takes the seed, the enemy who's trying to persecute with anxiety, with fear, with demonic oppression, with just crisis. We pray against that, Lord, and we pray for mercy. We pray that you'll keep us in a place of mercy and we won't harden and say, why are we walking through this? Or we won't say, all right, we'll step away from what the Lord has called me to do so that I don't have to face this oppression and we'll make a deal with the enemy. If you'll leave me alone, I'll stop pressing in. God, we pray against that and we pray that you'll give us mercy to continue to walk with you and to see this through. And we rebuke the enemy in Jesus' name. And God, for those of us who have become so consumed that we say, I have gone another day and I don't think I've carved out a moment to reflect on who you are and your goodness, 
for those of us that are trying to maintain an unsustainable pace. God, I pray that you'll just transport us now to, to the region of Galilee and we'll see you walking from one city to the next at your pace. We'll be reminded of you going and hiding out and people looking for you and you saying, let's go somewhere else. Let's go over here. Let's go over there. And not being dominated by the tyranny of the urgent. Lord, I pray that you'll have mercy on us and our hearts that are so consumed with beeps and buzzing and uh, alerts that you'll have mercy on us and give us permission and let us give ourselves permission to quiet our souls. God, those things that are so consuming with our schedules or our children's schedules or work or home or the people that we're taking care of, I pray that you will help us to stay centered so that we're not choked out by the cares and worries of this world. And God, for those here that are pursuing success in an unhealthy way, as a way to find meaning and value and worth or to prove something, I pray that you'll have mercy on them. Thank you for the mercy that you've had on me for the seasons that I've done that. I pray that you'll have mercy on them, Lord, and give them the fullness and, 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 uh, and, and the freedom to know that they can sit with you and be exactly who they are in your presence. They don't have to achieve anything with you. You're with them. And then they can reorient those pursuits in a way that's healthy and sustainable. And God, I pray for all of us that we will receive your word, that we will receive it, Thank you, Lord, for mercy. Thank you that you have mercy on us. You're all powerful. You're all knowing. You sustain this universe. God, I just think about there's angels that fly around you and just cry out how holy you are. And you, you look down and you, you have mercy on us and you stand with us and you're, you're there with us and you care. May that break our hearts, Lord. May that break our hearts. So God, as we move into this time of prayer, and as people come forward for prayer in just a few moments, I pray that each and every place we find ourselves in, maybe I said something that resonated, maybe there's something that I didn't say, but Holy Spirit, you made sure that they heard what needed to be heard. I pray that as we come forward, and as we pray over each other, that literally through our prayer, through the prophetic prayer, Holy Spirit, you'll be sowing seeds. And maybe things that we haven't been able to hear before, we'll hear today. Maybe things that we haven't been able to receive before, we will receive today. Melissa, do you remember what you um, shared with us during the time of prayer? Do you remember that picture? Okay. Melissa's going to come up and lead us into a time of prayer. And she had something very specific that she felt like God was showing her while we were praying before the service. And I, I want her to share that and then continue to lead us uh, in a time of prayer together. When we were praying this morning before, before the service and Jared was talking about the idea of soil. I just, I really had this picture of um, what, what makes healthy soil. And I, I saw a picture of just compost was what, it, what came to mind. And, and what compost really is, is it's you take all the things that are dead, that are cut off, that are almost like the waste. And what it does is it, it breaks down and it turns into, they literally call it black gold. Right? It is the thing that you put on the soil that brings life. 
um, to, to the plants and to allow stuff to grow. And just the idea of what, how God does that. Like there are things in our life, there are broken, dead, cut off places that the enemy has meant for death, for trash, to be cast off. But what God does is he turns it into life right? Like that is the gospel. That is the hope. That is the promise, right? Those chains that God cut off, those, those broken addictions, those past lives, those paths we used to walk on, those broken hearts, those disappointments put into sort of the compost bin of God turns into life, turns into the richest life. And so as we move forward in prayer this morning, I mean, there are I, how could any of us know what God has placed on your heart? But who in this room does not have some dead things, some of those hard things in their heart that God wants to cut free and use for life? And so I pray this morning, we have space, we have time to, to bring these to God, to, to you know, that it's almost like the other communion of, of reflecting our heart and what God has for us this morning.